All right, so tonight I am really excited to welcome Elaine Gerber, who is an alpaca farmer here in New York. She's in Saratoga County, is Saratoga, Saratoga County. County. And today she invited me to her farm. As you can see, I've got some footage rolling of us checking out her boy band, her group of male alpacas. And Desires. yeah, so handsome. And then we also saw her dams who are really beautiful as well. So when I first met Elaine, I'm just struck by how much she knows about alpacas, just sheer information load. I mean, you could really just talk to her for hours and get new information for the entire time. Um, so I'm going to try to condense this call in specific to some questions that I think um, everybody will find interesting based on what you guys are here for. So alpacas are a, a fiber animal. They're in the camelid family. What do you think makes alpacas really great about being a livestock animal? Like why would you, why did you pick alpacas over sheep, for example? I chose alpacas for not really good reasons, but they were awfully cute. So I went on the Washington County Fiber Tour, got bit by the bug, came home and told my husband, I want three alpacas for lawn ornaments. He said, figure out a business. So we figured out a business with alpacas, but they're just, they're low maintenance, they're easy keepers most of the time. I mean, they are livestock and they just are um, an easier animal to raise. Yeah, so I've heard it said that like sheep, a sheep is an, an animal that's always got it in for itself. It's like always doing something that's gonna get it in trouble and get it snatched up by another critter or... I don't know sheep at all. No, no, but alpacas seem like they're a herd animal that sticks together and they're larger. So do they protect themselves better? I know you they, have dogs. They, they are a prey animal. Um, they're 100% prey, but they are a herd animal. So they will take turns sleeping. And that's why you never want to have less than three because you want to give everybody a break to take a nap whenever. Um, not any real defenses against animals. You notice that we have five foot no climb fence around our farm. It's not to keep the alpacas in, it's to keep the animals out. We have to talk just a little louder. Oops, have to I'm talk, just louder. To talk, talk a little louder. louder. Um, so we have, we do have two great Pyrenees. They're farm dogs, they're not barn animals. They come up and they live in the house, but they do urinate and they keep critters away. Um, the alpacas will sound the alarm calls. I, I know some people use them to guard sheep. They're not good guardians, but they do make alarms. We have one farm that we shear for that has three alpacas just so they'll yell when anything comes by. Great, great. So with the alpacas that you raise, a lot of what you're focused on is the individual animal's fiber quality. And we talked today a lot about genetics. Yes. So I feel like a great question I could ask you for everyone who's in the call is if I'm thinking about getting into alpacas, where do I even start? You know, you say I need to start with three animals. Would that be a male and two females? No. Um, you, uh, never, you never want to start with a male if you don't have to, because if you're doing genetics, one male can do a lot of work. And if you only have two girls, then once those two girls are bred, that male has no purpose because he'll be related to everybody. Um, we recommend, depending on what you want to do, if you want to do breeding, obviously start with three girls. We have clients that just want alpacas to have lawn ornaments in their backyard, and we recommend males for those because without a uterus, there are less issues with health. Okay. They are very stoic. There are very few issues with health, but it's always good to remove any factors that you can. So... Elaine showed me some of the really cool things about alpaca while I was on the farm. They come in a lot of different colors, like 16, 16 colors. And this is a good example of an animal that maybe at first glance, you would think that this was a red fleeced animal, like a cinnamon fleeced animal. But when you get in, you notice that his core fleece is actually going to be gray. He's a rose gray. Um, his whole blanket is, is a beautiful rose gray that actually spins up into lavender yarn. So he's really quite exquisite and he makes beautiful babies. So he has great value on the farm because of what he procreates. Yeah. So I would have never, I mean, as someone who doesn't know a ton about, I feel like I'm pretty informed as a knitter about alpacas, yeah. 
But when it would come to identifying an animal and what color fleece I'm going to get, I wouldn't have realized looking at this alpaca that he was not a cinnamon colored fleece. He's beautiful. So now you guys know if you're looking at them, definitely like get your hands in there. What else? Well, going yeah. back to this. So when an alpaca, when you do the color on an alpaca, that's the boy that we're looking at. When you do the color on an alpaca, you always want to open the fleece and the color is what's against the skin. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says it's a true black animal, it's a gray animal, whatever you're seeing on the surface really doesn't mean anything. It's what's in the skin. So, so you're really breeding for fleece here. And you saw one of your younger males. He's a yearling. Um, and here's his fleece close up. When we're looking at alpacas for fleeces, obviously there's all the stages in processing. This particular alpaca has the same fleece throughout his entire coat. He does. He, uh, he's a small alpaca, so he doesn't do great in a halter show, but he does win championships for his fiber because we're here, we're looking up on his shoulder. And it's hard to see, but the crimp style on his shoulder is the exact same as the crimp style within his blanket, which is the exact same as the crimp style on his hind end. So he is very consistent throughout He's got beautiful, dense staples where the fiber gathers into groupings. He is fine. Um, he's just spectacular fiber animal. So here he is a little further back so you guys can see him. Um, um, I yeah. want all that fiber. <laughs> can, can I have um, all of that? Can I pre-buy that? Can somebody else beat you to it. Oh, um, they're go probably back paying hands dinner prices too. They are. Um, yeah, okay, nice try. Yeah. If that sheep, if that alpaca turns up shorn some morning. It'll surprise um, me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, check, the way I'll check my fingerprints. Um, but it, it's a tough to see. It's tough to see in that picture, but we talked a little bit about confirmation. And, I've got a much oh, better shot we, of it. We have a better yeah, confirmation. Yeah, yeah, wait till you see the confirmation on this Korea. He's okay. so good. So then we went over and we looked at um, your females. So this is your, like most of the breeding stock is in your, the genetics are in your females, right? Like, yes, you're kind of picking and choosing. Um, we do. And we, and then we pull in what the herd sire has. So yeah, the girls, they are what they are. And even ugly alpacas, like the one on the far right there, she is the dam of the one that we just looked at. So she may be ugly, but she creates a beautiful baby. She's the one on the right. I'm, I'm pointing, like you can see where I'm pointing, but she's half turned towards us. So um, she's got Another great way. genetics, but she's ugly. <laughs> That's yeah, so. what I feel like. Yeah. Um, so here's some more shots. I think this is the super friendly one. So we'll see. Yeah. So this is one of your younger, the this Krias. Is a this is a juvie. Um, he's great. Yeah. So another example of that least like not showing at first glance what it, and oh, this no, really a girl okay, that's, um, yep that's a girl actually sorry it's not a he it's a she and she's a beautiful gray girl and here's a little tiny one we just had to share this because she's so small and brand new just she two is. weeks old so can you see her she's um you'll see her really well she's about to come around okay. there she is oh she's so cute yesterday. yeah she's waiting for a playmate hopefully any day really precious and small so they're very small animals like you probably need to have a lot of protection for them at this stage the dams that's the fencing does that and the dams do that and they're 12 to 20 12 to 18 pounds is the average size baby when and it's how formed. much space do you need for your herd of three your herd of six depends on how you're feeding as you saw we have a lot of animals in a small spot we're a dry lot we live on glacial sand grass is tough to grow so we feed hay um they say six per acre if you're doing pasture. Okay, so if you're in pasture, six per acre, yes. and if you're doing barn and hay, you can have them in a smaller, yeah, smaller okay. area. And they are. We probably have about twenty animals on two acres. Okay. Then this little guy is, was particularly beautiful. I'm in love with these rose gray. Like he's a silver gray and silver gray yeah, they're my favorite yeah too. just gorgeous coloring and you see the crimp on that I mean I feel like you really see with alpaca the quality of the fiber if you get your hands on it and I'll I take that one it. too well you, you can take him isn't he gorgeous um he's I don't know if you noticed how long he is he was shorn in October so he has not been growing that fiber for a very long time wow and, and you know why fiber. I won it 
I don't usually spin a lot of alpaca by itself because it, even with all that crimp, it'll stretch out a little in knitwear. Um, we like to use it to soften comparable staple style wool. So a wool that we get a lot of here is a Coriadale. Um, and boy, that fiber you just showed me blended with a white or a gray Coriadale would be absolutely amazing. Well, we will talk MJ because I'd love to do something with this fiber instead of throwing it into a batch. Oh yeah, don't put that in a batch. Let me put it into, uh, for example, that line of um, three ply alpaca Coriadale that we make for oysters and pearls or we make it for Cornwall Yarn Shop. We had another yarn shop come by at Fiber Tour wanting that. That's, that's the kind of fiber we need. But sorry to interrupt, we're talking about, um, well, it sort of fits, right? We're talking about grading and what we're talking about is staple length. We're talking about uniformity in crimp. We're talking about uniformity from head to tail on the animal. So I guess we're talking about grading, aren't we? Yeah, let's talk about grading and also about color. Okay. So obviously, if you're looking to sell your fiber to someone like Bat and Kill, there are certain colors that are more desirable, more usable. It, it's so um, user dependent. Yes. It is, it is very much just what you like. I prefer black. You like the black. But for us at the mill, white and gray yeah. and the Fawn. lighter fawns are really more versatile if we're going to have it dyed or if we're selling it on to an indie dyer um, or a company. So when you're choosing your animals, you should definitely think about the color, right? You can, but there are no guarantees. No guarantees. No, they're starting right now. They're trying to do some work and they're coming down where they're saying, well, you can look at it genetically to see what it probably will. But is it just too many variations still? Like it's, with the Shetland sheep where they have like all the different... I don't know about Shetland sheep, but I know that they've been working on this for a long time and it's it's tough to identify. Um, so really it should all be about the texture of the fleece then. Fiber. So let's talk about the grades because okay. I don't know anything about grading. How do you start learning about grading? Um, there's a course that's offered actually through Cobal Skill which means nothing to you, but it's a fairly local to the Capital District of New York um, College that it's a weekend course and you learn how to look at the alpaca and it's based on microns for the most part, the grading is microns and I, you develop an eye and I'm sure MJ, you've got the eye now that you can look and say, oh, that's under 20, that's 23, which is what we do when we go through and we, when I sort out my, my fiber, I've taken the course, I'm not a certified grader yet. I haven't done all three courses, but I know enough to look at my animals and say, this one is grade one, grade two, grade three, and sort them out. And so it's mostly based on fiber diameter. Don't look at crimp. That doesn't go into the grading process, the density of the animal, because you're, MJ, you don't care how dense an animal is. You just care what the fiber looks like. So you, it's based on grading is totally based on lack of guard hair, which are the very straight pokey hairs and fiber diameter. Yeah, and I didn't really feel that many pokey hairs on your alpacas No, today. there are some, um, the older they get, they're just like us. They get old and wiry and- the So girls, the older the animal, yeah. the wire, just like with sheep. I guess. Um, yeah. So yeah. we're sheep. And then also the girls, the more babies they have, the older, the nastier the fiber It's that protein gets. loss yeah. over so. time. So- I put a link to the- the alpaca grading class at Cobal Skill oh, into okay. the chat for everyone to see. Um, it's my understanding that you don't have to be a New Yorker to no, attend I that. And there's some cute bed and breakfast and Airbnbs in Cobal Skill, which is only less than an hour from the Albany Airport. So no, it's a great weekend of going to the class and coming to see the mill. We'd love to have you. Now, MJ, do they also, I think they might also offer the class online, but I'm not sure. Uh, that I don't know, yeah. but. But people um, can check it out. Yes. So I want to show um, this little guy who is an example of good confirmation. Yes. So tell us more about what confirmation means. So if you look under his legs, he's, whoops, never mind. It's okay. We're looking at teeth. Hold oh, on. Okay. Let's start over. Um, if you look under his legs, he's a perfect little square. His neck is very upright. 
he walks with a very smooth gait and he has beautiful conformation. And then another thing that you said we could look at is the teeth and jaw lining yeah. up, which we're going to show on this other Kriya. You see the bottom teeth line up with that top gum on the jaw. So you don't want the teeth that can poke out. You really don't want that too much. I'll roll back so that we can see that. So see. it's just like straight, zoom in. you know. Yeah. Oops. Oh, you're good. But he is a cute little guy. Oh my gosh, I Definitely love him. Definitely adorable. If you go to a fiber shot and we zoom, that might. Yeah. So let's look at this. Oops. So this animal. But I want born. that one. Well, the funny story on him is he was born and we're like, ugh. We thought hamburger maybe. And then we looked at him four months later and went, well, where did that fiber come from? Because all of a sudden he turned beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm like, we don't know where it came from because it wasn't there when he was born. Amazing. They can totally change as yeah. they age. Like that's just a really good example. And he's a true black. He's a true black. It's hard to tell him that lighting, but he's as it black as warmer black here, can right? be. Yeah. yeah, really, really beautiful. So- yeah. What other questions we wanted to talk about poop? I was going to say, let's go to the poop. Let's because, talk about poop. <laughs> um, I don't know anything about sheep, but with alpaca poop, you can take alpaca poop right out of the manufacturer, put it on your plant and it won't burn it. Wow. It, they're such efficient digesters because of where they live. They originated in the Alpha Plana, very low nutrients in anything that they eat. So they had to suck every nutrient out. So their poo is very... Cool. It doesn't Does that make things. them pretty resilient as animals? Are they prone to lots of diseases? No, they, um, the big thing they have here is parasites. Um, putting alpacas and goats together, it can be done, but it, you're inviting trouble because goats can have like a bazillion parasites and survive. Alpacas can't. Um, they've only been in the U.S. since 1984 and whoever from Catskill, they came to the Catskill game farm mm -hmm. originally for quarantine. But they haven't been in the U.S. to be exposed to all this stuff for what, not even 40 years yet. So that's a wow. big factor. They are very, as far as vet bills go, not a lot of them. Um, they're stoic creatures, so usually you don't know something's wrong with them until it's really too late. The more I learn about alpacas, the more I think they're kind of like cats. Like we talked a little okay. bit earlier about their skin yeah. and shearing and how the shearing method is very different than yes. with sheep. So do you want to talk about that real we quick? We can. So with sheep, um, I've only seen them shorn a couple of times. We will not shear a sheep because they scare us. But you kind of sit them on their butt and go around them and take the fiber off. And alpaca, they've got those long legs that they can kick. They don't sit on their butt. So they're tied down with their wrists and their ankles, and then they're stretched out. It doesn't harm the animal. The animal is very safe. Um, you never put enough pressure on them that you're gonna do any damage to them. And everything is safe. The skin is tight because they do have very thin skin and it, it doesn't take a lot to hit it with the shears and you have a really big issue. So definitely if you're gonna have alpacas shorn, you wanna make sure your shearer knows how to shear alpacas really well. Because a lot of sheep shearers can do alpacas, but some sheep shearers can make a total mess out of alpacas. Good to know. Did anyone have any other questions? that we want to answer with this Zoom before we close out for the evening. I know Elaine has another call, like right after this, she's in high demand. We're good. We're good. Yeah, we're doing great. Okay. We're great. I um, just added Elaine's email address in the chat. If, um, uh, people MJ, can to... I ask that you change it to Woodland Meadow Farm at Gmail? Oh, certainly. Sorry, everyone different email ignore that of course i don't know how to delete that so that's okay, it's okay. Lynn, i'll still answer Meadow farm at gmail.com so in case anyone wants to follow up with elaine other resources will be coming from hannah when she does some follow-up e-newses uh, i saw quite a few people join us once the call began and um, I know one of them is a customer of ours, um, Andrea from Ohio, who doesn't have alpacas of her own, but is always interested in how to buy a good alpaca fleece and what she can blend it with. 
Um, we've spun quite a lot of nice yarn for her yarn shop from all Ohio sourced materials, local alpaca, local wool. Um, and we're delighted to work with Andrea on that. If we have just another minute, maybe we could get Andrea to tell us a little about the yarns and what her customers, if you don't, we're not giving away a secret, Andrea, people in the call are from all over the country. It's not like their customers are gonna, you're gonna lose your customers, they're gonna go to them. But if you could share, if you don't mind, a little sure. of how you've designed your yarns with alpaca. Um, well, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late because I ran home from the shop. So I, I ran late at work. Um, so I missed the beginning parts. I had no idea uh, the shearing part. That was really cool. Um, and I'm gonna watch afterwards um, the recording for the rest. Um, I collected, I started my whole thing by collecting ribbon winners at the Ohio State Fair and at other fiber shows in Ohio. And I created the first yarn with um, MJ. And as I'm learning more and more of this process, I'm very intrigued and I have a business partner that we're gonna try to open a mini mill here in Columbus um, to do regional. And we have a lot of alpaca growers out here and not all alpaca is good. I've learned, <laughs> yeah. And so the, uh, I um, recently got back, a, um, I have one farmer that I work with, with my wool. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm probably taking too long, but I have one farmer that I work with my wool and I am going up on Sunday to pick up my next batch. Um, they are retiring. But I had a wool grower and she would get, or an alpaca grower, and she would also collect alpaca. Is it blankets? Because it said blanket on the bag. Okay. So I. Um, the blanket goes from the shoulders to the hips and right to underneath the belly, and that's the prime fiber. Okay. So Sorry. I collected her. Right before she retired, I collected her blankets that she had left. And there were four different colors. And I didn't know really what I wanted. I let MJ lead a little bit, but I wanted to take natural color Corydale and the natural colors and blend this amazing, you know, crazy yarn. And little did I know there was a little bit of shortcuts in there. And when I actually was able, I also at the same time had MJ do Border Lester and Corydale. So I had two separate batches and we talked about it and we, I had them spin all the singles at the same time. And then we made a DK with, um, 50-50 alpaca and Corydale. And we did it in white and we did natural colors. And then we did the same with the Corydale and Border Luster. And again, a little bit of short, just shortcuts and stuff in there. And when I I I when I got the yarn, I I don't remember, or I I not that I don't remember, I forgot that I said I'll wash it so I get this sleek crazy yarn and I'm like going wow I, I'm under impressed this is like ugh, what is this but it had so many machine oils and the lanolin and all that in there so as I went through every skein all 200 and something skeins it was a crazy amount of yarn I washed them and they dried and went boof. And the shortcuts became these really cute little neps in there. So it, it's kind of tweety, 
But that Corydale, the brown Corydale and the, um, the natural colored Corydale and the natural colored uh, alpacas, I had a real dark chocolate. I had two cinnamon colors. And I think there was one other one that was light as well. Most beautiful. And I don't know how to replicate that because she retired. So now I have to learn what alpaca fleet or blankets look like and how to buy them and make my um, yarns up. And I'm learning so much. Yeah, I would love, I would love your thoughts on that, Elaine. How do you know when you're looking at a blanket, if it's good or if it's not good, unless you know how to grade, do you really have to know how to grade if you're buying fiber? I would not, I guess some people do know, but that, I think that you're probably mentally grading without knowing that you're grading because you're looking, you're pulling out a sample and you're saying, you spread it out and you say, is this coarse? Is this, um, does it feel like something I'd want against my skin? And you'll look at it and, and just visually See. The good thing with the alpaca, at least, is that it's not, it doesn't have lanolin like the no. sheep. So it's not greasy when you're touching the blanket or even the animal no. is not greasy. So you're really getting a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like washed up because it's almost kind of all ready it there. Is. It is. And it's, I don't know how it is to skirt sheep, but skirting alpaca is usually pretty quick and easy. You pull off the edges and nothing happens in the middle. I don't know if sheep are like that or not. But when we skirt, we go around the edges. Um, we do look, the shorts are usually pulled out because that's sure, that's um, bad shearing that can see the shorts. So we usually will try and pull those out as we're pulling the blanket off, but definitely before I would process, I would pull the shorts out. And you're shearing in just like a weekend, next weekend, two um, weekends from now? Four days. Four days. So she's going to be busy shearing. You better put some pictures and quick videos on your Instagram for us to see um because I'm super interested in that process and so what is your it? Instagram name I'll type that here too it's Woodland Meadow Farm well that's a creative name you like that I am just so clever almost as clever as bat and kill fiber <laughs> <laughs> well we have we've recorded this session so uh, Andrea, you mentioned you missed the beginning. We've got a few other people who joined who missed the beginning. Don't worry, we're going to definitely send this out. We're a little behind getting some of our emails out right now, and that's just because I've been traveling here to be here with all of you guys. But I will be catching up this week, and so you'll see this email probably next week. And I'll just ask MJ if you want to put up wmfalpaca.com. That's our website. Yeah. And Elaine's also working on kind of a regional project with the wool pool. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Um, we're actually working where we're going to be locally, Southern Adirondack, Hudson Valley, gathering alpaca fiber. We're looking at creating a yarn and end product of not yarn worthy fiber to be determined, um, which will allow farmers with only a few animals the opportunity to get some yarn at a reasonable rate and make something out of their alpacas instead of just sticking in the barn where it serves no value to anybody. So just in round numbers, if, if someone with a small flock wanted to be part of the Southern Adirondack alpaca producers co-op, um, you could get, get in with 10 pounds of fiber um, blanket, but doesn't have to be grade one, grade two should be fine. Um, so you go in with 10 pounds and you get 10 hundred gram skeins back. And then without really needing to take off your shoes and socks and so on to count, if you put in 20 pounds, you could get back 20 skeins and 30 pounds and so on. And the retail, suggested retail on the skeins that Elaine is designing is about $30 a skein. So it's a pretty exciting opportunity for um, for farmers who are not, they don't have quite as many animals as you, but they want to be able to participate in something larger. And, and, and it is, and to not have, we share at so many farms that are small that will go in and say, oh, I see you still got last year's fiber here. Oh, and the year be, oh, and the year before. And it's like, yeah, we don't know what to do with it. So this is going to give people the opportunity to do something with their fiber. Awesome. I, I think we have to caution on, 
how many year of year before we really want to. Yeah, we don't want to go back more than two years, that's for sure. Because um, regardless of how careful you think you are, things have a way of moving into your bag of fleece. Yes. And, um, that's just not, no. not pretty. Nothing um, like sticking your hand in and finding a mouse. <laughs> It, we, that happened recently. Oh, no. No, it These was things happen because you don't have good storage, so you end up putting it. It's a surprise yeah. cat. It's a surprise new cat. It was awesome. I was like, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to feel any of them here. No. No. Or any mice in the middle. either. No, and no bugs. No, and you get moths. A lot of times moths will go in. Um, just don't store your fiber forever. And that's what we're going to prevent from happening by doing the gathering of a whirlpool. A whirlpool. And hopefully so, once the Hudson Valley Textile Project's new scouring facility comes online for you local to the area, I mean, you drive as far as you want, but it's a long haul from Missouri to the, the Textile Project scouring facility. Anyhow, if you don't quite know what you want to do next, at least you could get your fiber washed and it would take up less room and you could store it very carefully. A um, lot less chance of insects wanting to live in clean fiber than dirty fiber. And the only thing I'll add to that is that we throw a dryer sheet in with our fiber when we shear, which also helps deter whatever. It's not guaranteed, but it helps to deter. Just don't put a mothball in there. Oh, I would never do that. I know you <laughs> wouldn't, but I just, I can't resist a chance to ask people to never put a mothball anywhere near their fiber. I never would have thought of that. You know, someone has thought of it. Though. Somebody has thought of it. <laughs> oh, I've seen it. I've seen it. It ruins uh, our equipment. It ruins the health of the people who work here. It's, it, I don't, I don't think it hurts the fiber, but boy, the people who are going to use that fiber are really impacted by that. Yeah. So MJ, is there a negative to putting the fiber sheet, the dryer sheets in there? Not that I'm aware of, because after okay. all, we put dryer sheets in the same load of wash. We put our face cloths and our panties okay. and so on. So, ooh, can I say panties on a recording? <laughs> You'll cut that out. Zoom. Anna, right? I'll edit it out for you. Okay. I'll just sweep you out. Then they'll really wonder what you're putting in the washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been so fun and interesting. interesting. I feel like I learned a ton today and I'll definitely be posting some of those videos and pictures on our Instagram for people to see and to hear about the wool pool and to watch this video again next week when I send it out by email. I'm so glad that you guys could join us tonight. Thank you. Thank and I'm you. so glad you were Thank here. Thank you for having me. I enjoy it so much. MJ, I love, I've loved your Zoom since the first one and how far you've come. Oh yeah, for me and Carol saying, Gosh, it's Tuesday night. Maybe we should just do a Zoom. And <laughs> now, now we've kind of gone, gone wild. We're going to have special edition Zoom from Maryland Sheep and Wool soon also. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much for, for joining. And, and do be in touch. Send emails. Give a call with any, any questions. And we really appreciate you being part of the Bat and Kill community. Yeah, and if you have any other questions and you'd like them answered in that follow-up email, go ahead and send them in by email. Just reply back to that invitation Zoom uh, email and we'll submit them to Elaine and get them answered before I send out that recap. So if you think about a question between now and Friday that you would like answered, just go ahead and send it in. And MJ, I will just say that you have clever, creative, wonderful ways to deal with all quality fibers. And I don't have enough good things to say about that, Kel. Well, thank you. And that we didn't even get to that clever and creative part of making just some roving for dryer balls or sending to a felter to have made into insoles for, for boots or just sheets of felt for chair pads or horse blankets. I've seen a lot of uses and the oh, yeah. coarser, the more guard hairs, the better folks, um, because they won't compress as much over time. So it 
keeps your felt nice and nice and squishy. We'll have to have a whole nother call from a felt maker. Yeah, we might have to quiz you about things to include in that email too. Make sure that <laughs> that info doesn't slip through anyone's True. finger. True. We'll, uh, yeah. we'll make sure we include something about felt making. For sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to hang up now. And Thank you. Bye. Bye.